with people south of our border, but they did it to us back in Reconstruction. Anyway, I digress. Um, let me see. It, it was also a trespass against what they considered the natural order of things. Something had to be done. Enter the pig laws. I am a great-grandson of enslaved Africans, and my family history is replete with tales of misery and woe directly and indirectly imposed by these statutes. The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution abolished slavery and involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime. In consideration of this, black life was intentionally criminalized in the South as a means of re-enslaving African Americans. Under the pig laws, it was considered a crime for a black person to walk along the side of a railroad track, to speak too loudly in the vicinity of white women, or even to spit in the street. The pig laws also function as a slanderous public relations campaign, negatively transforming the general public's perception of African Americans, a people who not 20 years prior had been considered loyal, trustworthy, and hardworking, came to be considered shiftless, lazy, and dangerous. What am I seeing? Breon is giving you the, the clock that we're at 12 minutes. <laughs> and he did it in such a subtle way, too. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is, right, I mean, man. what you're breaking down is one of the most critical and fundamental points to understanding yeah. America's prison system. Yep. So yep. it's critical, but it, give us, give us like a concluding line, and then let's let's get to the discussion. All right. Um, wow. There's so much more to say. I know. A concluding I know. line. Absolutely. Um, I hate ultimately, to do it. Blame, blame yeah. for ten minutes. Yeah. But anyway. yeah. Ultimately, the only thing I guess I could see to conclude is that um, in order to understand the present. And in order to be able to prognosticate the future, you have to be a, an ardent and strident student of history. Right. Ta-da! Agree. Absolutely. Agree. Agree. Beautifully Thank said. You. Thank you. Um, so there's that de delayed video here, huh? <coughs> so um, I guess we're going to move on to DC. Hi. 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 <laughs> um, so I'm Seema, I'm the policy director here at the ACLU of the nation's capital, and I'm joined by Kendrick, who is a part of our team, but is also um, representing the University of the District of Columbia Law School. And he's bringing a message from um, Joe Tolman, who also sends his regards to Breon Bain, hey, who coming. is um, a juvenile justice legend here in DC. And I'm with sort of the brains behind a lot of what we do, our staff attorney, Jennifer Wiedekind, but I will give our presentation. And I'm going to give it sort of in um, three parts. I'm going to talk about the D.C. landscape, um, our theory of change, and what we hope to accomplish. So the District of Columbia is not a state, and that has serious implications for us in D.C. What that means is that anytime we pass a law related to um, criminal law, it has to actually go before Congress and it has to not be overturned by Congress. So that means all of our laws are subjected to the most um, sort of asinine political football that occurs in Congress. So that's sort of just, just to set the stage. So DC formerly known and, and to, for some still known as Chocolate City has undergone tremendous gentrification over the past 10 years. Um, we have lost double digits, our African American population, but the population here in DC still remains 50% black. So it's about 50% black and about 40% white and with a growing 10% Latino and other population. Um, we are sort of the heartbeat of mass incarceration here in the United States in the District of Columbia. I mean, just looking at like sort of the size and the rate of incarceration of our population, we have um, of a population of total six, 600,000 people, we have 60,000 returning citizens. Um, not just that, every single year there are 45,000 arrests um, in the District of Columbia and 96% of those arrests are for nonviolent offenses. Um, so 10% of our population is, is returning citizens. And really, we are a tale of two, two cities. I mean, even looking at the Anacostia, which is known as East of the River, um, Anacostia sits across the river from um, Alexandria, Virginia. Alexandria, Virginia actually has the highest life expectancy in the country, and Anacostia has the lowest. So we are, you know, at the um, at the footsteps of Congress and the Capitol and in many ways in the shadow of the Capitol. But, you know, nationally, our, our incarceration rates in the United States are shameful. Something like, I believe, one out of every three African-American males spends time in jail or prison. Well, in D.C., that number is three out of every four. So when you think about um, the 
disenfranchisement of the entire community, the tearing apart of the Black family, of the very infrastructure, the fabric of the community, and the ability to fully participate with respect to civil rights, civil liberties, and human rights, um, human dignity. Um, we, we live and experience that every day. So that's where we are. And our theory of change is about not policy, but power. We want to build um, power. We believe that across the country, these policies range. You know, many of the things I've been hearing you all talk about, we, we have some variation of that in D.C., but the experience of black people, of people of color, of poor people in this country pretty much is the same no matter where you go. It's sort of different shades of the same flavor, you know, and so... We, we believe that that is a product of structural racism. And so we think about the need for not only policy change, but culture shift and how we move people along in the way they understand things. So I couldn't sort of put our whole theory of change into, Jennifer advised me not to talk too much. I'm talking really fast. Um, I'm trying to be brief. So I, I have like sort of four or five main things. And if there are questions afterwards, I'm happy to um, try and answer them. Um, so these are some of the tools that the strategies that we use to build power. So we democratize the law. We build leadership. So what does that mean? We're attorneys, but there's no reason why we're the only ones who can meaningfully participate in uh, conversations about what the law should look like. Part of that requires us to engage with people who are on the ground and to help them frame their arguments in terms that can be taken seriously by lawmakers, even when we don't necessarily agree with them. And a perfect example is the D.C. Ferguson movement that's been bringing hundreds and hundreds of people out on the street and that is calling for, you know, their main call is for indictment of officers who have um, committed such and such crimes. Now, our position is that, you know, criminalization does not deter bad behavior. And so we're looking for an overhaul of the policing structure entirely, um, more so focused on punishing bad apples. Um, but yet we still work with them and help them develop their asks so that they're relevant, that they're, you know, legally relevant, and that they can participate meaningfully as equal partners in a conversation where um, decisions are being made. Data. So we think um, we think a lot about data. I'm not going to get into the whole thing. I know Brianne knows I have a whole marijuana thing that I do here. Um, Jennifer and I authored a report you may have heard about, um, about racial disparities in arrests in the District of Columbia. And we focused on marijuana, but then we worked with the Washington Lawyers Committee to um, to look at arrests in general. Marijuana was an important indicator for two reasons. One, because we knew that everybody knows that white people like to smoke weed, white people on the call, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, um, but, but not just that, on the west side of our city, we had one of the highest marijuana consumption rates of anywhere in the country. So this was an important moment. It was also important because the call to change the marijuana laws came from the youth. Um, you know, through my um, workshops with the youth, they were identifying marijuana as the basis for pretextual stops. So Jennifer and I actually looked at 10 years of marijuana data outside of the national ACLU study and produced a shadow report. Part of what we did in that shadow report, and I, I can't show you the whole thing, is we, because this really worked well for you, so I'm trying to be like you, right? <laughs> Can you guys see it? Mm -hmm. Move it back a little bit, just a little bit. So we mapped every single arrest. We did this for the Washington Lawyers Committee as well. And one of the things we know is that sometimes people are unwilling to, at first, address issues of race. And talking about space, spatial and geographic um, um, discrimination was an important way to begin the conversation. But let me be clear, when we talk about discrimination or, and subjugation of black people under the law, we call it exactly what it is. But we needed to present it in a way to bring everybody to the table. And that's what this did. So this we, we use these, um, as people are doing all across the country, and I know Chicago has done similar things as well in looking at sort of spatial discrimination. Um, I'm going to keep going, but I'm going to say we never stop with the data. This is one of the reports we've released right now. Jennifer um, and I, and Jennifer really taking the lead, is looking at two and a half years of warrants. So looking at the ways in which policing of communities extends into the black home. And I say black because really that in D.C., that's what we're talking about versus other communities that have more sort of integrated and, and other um, 
communities in, in greater percentages. But we continue that data. When the um, public officials came back and said, no, black people consume marijuana outside, that's why they're getting arrested, we actually went back and looked at, how many minutes do I have? Uh, three. Oh, my God. <laughs> we, <laughs> no, no, we have the discussion part coming up. Okay, okay. We looked. Okay, you don't need to do all that. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. We, you were, we looked at... Um, you know, so we continue. We every time there's you know an argument, we go back to the data. We try to prove what's right and what's wrong, and and to frame the conversation as we move. We we build coalition. We just came out with ten Baptist um, ministers and their faith based organizations calling for an end to marijuana prohibition and for reparations. We try to reframe the discussion instead of a conversation that pits victims against so called offenders. We've identified that the victims of most crimes are young black men, and that our public safety techniques. Need need to make people feel safe. And that includes the community that is largely victimized by crime, that is black men. So if black men feel safe, public safety is failing. We think a lot about metrics. How do you measure and how do metrics create incentives for behavior? Um, you know, just a couple more things, bear with me. So this year, we, um, we were not the first to decriminalize marijuana, but we were the first in the country to move decriminalization on the basis of racial justice, and I can talk more about it later, how our bill reflected racial justice principles. We also just um, legalized marijuana in D.C. last week. And so what that was was um, racial justice. We put racial justice on the ballot. Before our report, the support for marijuana was well under the national 50 percent. In fact, in the black community, support for marijuana reform was at 37 percent. We moved legalization in the district with a margin of 70%. So that is a consensus. We put racial justice on the ballot, and we won here in D.C. We moved the conversation. We changed the, what the whole conversation is about. But we recognize that the question of racial justice is not just a question of, of criminal law. It's a question of economic justice. So as we move towards legalization in the district, we're moving for reparations, reinvestment, self-determination, and opportunities for collective ownership. We involve the young men who have been criminalized and who are distributing marijuana illegally in the conversations about what our future marijuana economy should look like. And we look beyond capitalist models of individual ownership and try to imagine different ways in which the law can provide opportunities for full participation. Finally, we have our prisoners, unlike other places, all of our prisoners are sent across the countries. That places you, it's almost like people are dropped out of helicopters when they come home, returning citizens. We're trying to bring our prisoners home. It may not be this year, it may not be next year. Some of you may have heard the ACLU just received $50 million to decarcerate. So it's not a question of, you know, um, if, it's just a question of when. We're bringing home between 50 and 80 percent of our prisoners in the next five to eight years. And um, we are going to push out the private prisons here in D.C. One point I want to share with folks before I close up is that GEO um, is anticipating, you know, GEO and CCA, the two major prison corporations, GEO is anticipating the fact that we are um, decarcerating, and they actually have a subsidiary company called GEO Cares, a company which is now making major investment in supervised release. So wow. we are going to decarcerate, but the, but the battle for justice and equality is not over there. And maybe in the question session, you can present some That's of right. the... Oh my God. Good job, fun. Nima, in 11 minutes and 36 seconds. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is... This is incredible. I feel like my brain just kind of expanded. No, I am muted. Yeah, can I ask a question really quickly to DC? We got kicked off real um, quickly, and you were just about to say what happened when you went looked at the data going into the homes, and and, and we missed that. When so you said we, that we're actually. Um, we started out trying to look at militarization of the police in D.C. We started by looking at warrants being executed by SWAT. We, this was about a year ago. Um, Jennifer and I quickly realized that it was much deeper than that, and so we have obtained what is probably going to be the first ever really full-scale look at how warrants, period, are effectuated. So we're looking at, you know, over 10,000 pages of documents, the affidavits, the, pre the, the interactions that result in the warrants, 
whose homes are being raided. And it, what, it, what this is doing is showing that the war on drugs really impacts more than the people who come in direct contact because of their so-called criminal activity. This is something that's impacting, you know, families and particularly women and children and mothers and grandmothers and wives. And, and so this is like affecting ability for housing and all the collateral consequences. So um, this study isn't... Um, come out yet? I think we need a couple more weeks or months. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So All right. So um, so we're going to bring this into Q&A. Um, we have New York left, um, which is also going to fall on me because actually our executive director who was supposed to present is stuck at another meeting. In the video. In the video. Oh, uh, and the video. Um, so <laughs> Um, so I want to say kind of a few things, and then I want to bring this into discussion. I'm going to change kind of the New York presentation a little bit because I want to try to kind of integrate what everyone said. Um, in that light, I want to present some kind of, I guess, theory of change, our kind of philosophy and our kind of operational methodology um, that I have been, um, I feel like has been re uh, confirmed when what everyone else has talked about. For us in New York, the, rep, uh, the organization I'm speaking on behalf of is the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions, which is the nation's first and only um, public policy think tank training advocacy organization founded and developed by formerly incarcerated leaders. Um, it was, and I'm going to share this because it gets to the main point that um, I'm going to get to. It really started out with, um, in the 70s, a study that was authored inside a prison in New York State called Greenhaven um, Correctional Facility, where there was a think tank group called Greenhaven Think Tank. And, and one of the major studies that they did that has now had repercussions all the way through here, which also relates to the mapping um, project that Seema talked about, was they started to write about, and they did a mapping project of, where everyone in prison came from. And this is a phenomenon that is true all across the country in the US. In the 70s, they discovered that 75% of people locked up in upstate New York, because New York's prisons are all located in upstate New York, not in New York City, come from, the vast majority of people locked up in New York State prisons, 75% come from seven neighborhoods in New York City. Mm. Right. So you're telling me that those seven neighborhoods houses all the criminals in New York State prisons, right? So you start thinking about that, and that's what actually gave the genesis of a lot of the thinking and foundation for Center for New Leadership, which is this. By the way, the seven neighborhoods back in the 70s, the same seven neighborhoods supply the prison population right now in 2014. This phenomenon exists in every single state in the US. And I'm sure Chicago can attest to that. I'm sure Houston can attest to that. The seven neighborhoods might change from 10 to actually for us, it's now 15. But what that talks about is, here's one line that we talk about. Prison industrial complex, as we call it, with the US prison population of 2 million, and of course, 8 million people under the supervision of some kind of criminal justice supervision. That's like the scope and scale of the US prison system. Prison industrial complex is about everything else but prison. For us, when we talk about prison reform or criminal justice reform, for us, it's about community development. Right? Starving the beast. And that starts with the communities that they're targeting with the empowerment. So for us as Center for New Leadership, and this is one thing that I want to present and get kind of your thoughts if we have time, we have a 10-year strategic plan, a vision of moving from criminal justice, which is what it's called in the US, and we always put quotation marks around it because there's no justice. Criminal justice to human justice. Two years ago, we launched and introduced the concept of human justice because when your starting point is criminal, you can never achieve justice. No way. Especially in this country, constitutionally, politically, historically, socially, culturally, psychologically. So, <laughs> that's, that, that's a presenter that's coming in right now. So for <laughs> us, the concept of human justice that we want all of our allies to give us feedback on, we have a formula for it, which is, Human rights plus human development equals human justice. The idea here is that we have to fight for our human rights, but we cannot stop there. In many ways, that's regressive, right? That we should be talking about, hey, human development, what does it take for us to reach the fullest potential? And that's what everyone's stuff talked about, right, in terms of 
humanity and really expanding the fullest potential of humanity. So with that, and, and I can say a lot about New York, and, and the last thing that I would say is this. New York City, that's the, 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 the capital of multicultural center. If you go into a juvenile detention facility, all, we have three juven, juvenile detention facilities. When I say juvenile, it's under 16, because in New York State, if you're 16, you're automatically considered an adult in the criminal justice system. They're trying to change that right now, but it's a long story. And for in New York City, New York State, 13, 14, 15-year-olds are automatically tried as adults if they commit one of 16 what they call violent felonies. Mm -hmm. And vast majority of those youth, you know what they're charged with? Robbery. Mm -hmm. Robbery is mm -hmm. taking place in group settings. And it's not to say robbery is small potatoes, but this is how we treat our youth. They go automatically into the adult system. Mm -hmm. So that's the phenomenon. And then when you go into every juvenile detention facility right now, 99%, I kid you not, is black and Latino youth. And that reality actually is the same pretty much all across the country with variations on the shape like, like Sima talked about. So having said that, that, that was a little bit for the Amsterdam and the London folks to give you a bit of a snapshot of U.S. Could I give a short reaction? Yes. And so let's open up for uh, questions and um, thoughts. I definitely have questions for. And introduce Divine. Oh, and, and Divine joined us. <laughs> Hello, Divine. We enjoyed you in the movie. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for watching. He's one of, he's one of the founders of Center for New Leadership. So. You got original questions? Put it to him. <laughs> but um, go ahead, uh, Franz. Well, I just want to uh, say something about uh, the reality in Holland. Um, what we are doing over here is closing a lot of prisons, closing a lot of juvenile prisons as well, uh, diminishing the uh, amount of uh, cells and incarcerated people. We come from about 14,000 in a population of 17 million people. We had 14,000 uh, inmates, and today we have about 8 till 9,000 inmates. And um, what you see in Holland is that we uh, our uh, criminality diminishes uh, a few percents in the last five years, but there's a very interesting phenomenon going on, and that is that um, our system doesn't work very well, our uh, juridical system, which means that in Holland you don't have a lot of uh, chance to get caught when you commit a crime. Um, when you are caught, we don't have the capacity capacity of uh, uh, doing investigations. The police doesn't have the capacity. They are reorganizing, reorganizing and sitting at their computers so they don't have time to catch thieves and uh, robbers. Uh, then we don't have enough uh, prosecutors. We don't have enough judges. And what you see is that... Um, the fact that we don't incarcerate people has a very positive uh, influence on the criminality rate. Nobody meant to do that. Nobody meant to uh, make the system work very bad. But because of the fact that the system works bad, our criminality rate lowers. Because when you put people into the system and you lock them up, you get more criminality. You understand yes. what I mean? No, I, it's 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 amazing hearing me from Amsterdam, whose 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 size of prison population I, I'm still in disbelief just compared to what it is here. So what I say is, I would advise you. You know, um, there's a very big disbalance disbalance in several countries in the world, in most countries in the world, and. Um, when you put a lot of effort in uh, chasing people, you know, you get the opposite effect, I think. So just leave them outside, try to find alternatives for punishments, uh, put people in their strengths, um, uh, and it, it sounds a little bit idealistic when I hear all those stories from uh, the United States cities, and also from England. Um, but come to Holland and you can see that uh, it's possible to do it in a different way. Well, Hans, this is Dr. Pryor. First, let me uh, 
thank everyone for joining us and say hello to everyone there. Um, and Hester Martin in particular. Hey, Hester, how are you doing? Yes, yeah, good to see you. She's an extraordinary young woman. Uh, and having visited uh, Holland and Amsterdam uh, and London, I kind of have an idea what you're talking about. And I think that uh, you, uh, you actually present a, a nice piece of the puzzle that we're attempting to configure with regards to human justice. That when you treat people like human beings, when you provide resources and allow their potential to be cultivated and nourished, when individuals are feed fairly and decently, um, you get the outcomes that you see there. So it doesn't surprise us when you talk to us about the environment there because we can just understand by how the society is constructed and the things that people are afforded that the outcomes that you see there um, are almost part of a natural evolution of what it is that you are providing. Thank you very much. So can I get some of the other cities? Um, raise your hand if you have some questions or reflections that you want to share from everything that you've heard. Um, yeah, Houston, Karegani. I actually have a question for, um, for Holland. Um, so you were speaking of um, your criminal justice system or, you know, what, in quotes, criminal justice system and how it works over there in respects to, to crime and kind of it, you know, having this, 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 um, this result that, that goes counter to the thinking in the United States and obviously in the UK as well. I was wondering as far as you all's murder rate, um, things such as that, well, what, what is it like right now? What, what's the statistics on that? The murder rate in Holland. Um, yes. I don't, I don't know the rates uh, by heart. I don't know the rate by heart. I know that the murder rate in general doesn't differ very much over the years. It is, uh, 14 persons, 12 to 14 persons in Amsterdam I hear over here. And there are uh, three quarters of a million people living there. I'm sorry, you said how many a year? <laughs> <laughs> three quarters of a million people living in, in uh, Amsterdam oh. and there are 12 uh, killings, 12 murders. Can I just say something? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Seema's going to jump in. One, one of the things in D.C. Um, that's been, you know, and I'm sure all across the United States, that's used to justify the type of police contacts and interface is the high rate of violent crime, particularly in black communities, to, to explain the over-policing. And that's why the, I, I really led this conversation on D.C., with this statistic that 96% of our police arrests are for nonviolent offenses. Because I think it's important to understand that of, of about 45,000 arrests every year, what is it? I'm not good at math. It's like 42,000 um, of those arrests are for nonviolent offenses. And that doesn't make our community safer. So if, if we were to take out those 42,000 arrests, and we were remain with what three thousand arrests. Then we could start to really think about whether or not what those arrests were leading to, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that um, I think that we need to change that narrative. Is what I'm trying to say. I think we need to change. We need to recapture and examine and say, is our criminal justice system and and at the front end that policing really rationally related to the violent crime it purports to address? And that's and and I'm gonna kick it to Roger in one second. New York has the same phenomenon. And what I want to share is, this is a pattern that we as activists have the hardest time with, which is all the legislations. It's the same thing happening in New York State with raise the age. Raising the age at which young people are tried as adults, the first group thrown under the bus is the youth charged with violent offenses. The youth who need it the most are the ones that they put out the first. Every legislation that they do, like the policing, it's always justified in terms of gangbangers and violent felonies. You say violent felony and everything gets shoved under. And that's the same thing happening. And the numbers, just to give you another shocking thing in New York City, you're talking about DC, SEMA. 16, 17 year olds in New York City getting arrested. If you just look at how many, six, about 17,000 16, 17 year olds get arrested about a year, in a year. Just 16, 17 year olds. Out of those 17,000, I kid you not, 90% are either dismissed 
or they receive non-criminal conviction, which is a violation. Yes. So we're talking about 18,000, 16, 17 year olds that we just put through the system who are gonna come out. This is, this is the start of that police contact and the shoving into the system, just in terms of the phenomena. So it's not even about, before we get to ma mass incarceration, there's mass arrests happening that has a whole another set of consequences on a community level and also on a system level. Right, um, which we should be mindful that when we're talking about youth charged with violent or convicted of violent offenses, you're talking about youth who have engaged in behaviors that are not violent in nature but simply classified. So let's say in D.C. we took the 42,000 out, we left with 3,000. We could even reduce that 3,000 probably in half when you look at the fact that many of those behaviors weren't even violent in nature. They were just categorized, you know, and classified as violent. Now we have the 1,500 left, and even that we can reduce down further, which means that actually when we get to the root of the cause, we're really talking about, you know, historical racism, racial profiling. We're, we're talking about over-policing. I mean, let's get right down to the real issue here. And until we get to those, you know, to the core of those issues, we're still going to be just throwing numbers around and not really dealing with the reality that we face in our communities every day. So let me, let me kick it to um, Roger. Roger. Hi. Hey, hi, Seema. How are you? Um, uh, what, the, all this stuff you just presented, is it available uh, anywhere, like in a, a document or anything like that? Um, well, what had happened was, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Yeah, we wrote a report. We wrote a report. It's on the ACLU-NCA website. And, and um, we, we have so two reports that I'll share. And um, I, I have my testimony on policing where we really break down the stuff for D.C. that we just submitted to the um, Inter-American Committee on Human Rights. They just heard it in relation to over-policing and Ferguson, generally policing in America. And that was about two weeks ago. Um, I have some things, and I'll, so, I'll forward so, them. So let me interject here for a second. I know this is our first annual, and we, we, we got off to the best start that we can. It's going to be just uphill from here. We do have a website that we did set up. It's a very initial website, but um, we have a great website. It's dada, D-A-D-A, -A, dot lyricsfromlockdown.com. So it's on Brian's website. Say it again. So it's D A D A da da dot lyrics from lockdown dot com. So you could actually upload stuff there. Um, so uploading of the video, and if you have any trouble, just email me, and and we'll troubleshoot it. Seema, if you can share some of the materials, we'll share it as well. That would be great. Mm -hmm. So that's one technical note. Can I ask a quick question to Amsterdam and London? Could you tell us, um, it, you know, despite your much smaller scale um, in terms of the prison population, what is the demographic, like what is the, r the racial and ethnic um, breakdown of folks inside your prisons? It, it's very heavily black uh, within our prisons, uh, and I can echo what you were saying with regard to the um, where the. Um, uh, incarcerated are coming from. Uh, it's very similar here. It's coming from particular areas, uh, inner cities, where uh, young people, particularly young blacks, are uh, very overrepresented within the prison population. So, on um, numbers smaller, but they are very. Uh, uh, the demographics are very similar. And what about? Uh in Amsterdam, uh, we have about, uh, it's about 50-50. 50% is uh, uh, colored people, which is uh, overrepresented uh, in the prison population too. Um, but I will, would like to throw in another phenomenon, and that's uh, the situation where people live in outside the prison. Uh, and I think the prison situation is a continuation uh, from what happens in society and what is probably a big difference between the United States, for example, and Holland, is that the difference uh, in uh, wages, you know, for example, uh, and the amount of poorness uh, gives a totally different image in our country. Okay. 
So I think poverty, poverty is a very uh, important issue when you're talking about uh, prison population. Absolutely. So DC just is rejoining us, um, and LA is also rejoining us. So let's take a few more questions, maybe two more questions. Two more questions, and then what I would love to hear from everyone is your best suggestions and your wish list for the next annual. Um, this was our very, um, very ambitious uh, start, and I want to thank everyone for all your patience. But after the two questions, I would really love for everyone to give some wish lists in terms of the, the, the next annual. Um, so any two questions, Ross, or, or reflections that you want to share? Did I see any? Uh, LA? LA. Yeah. LA. Um, this is another question for ACLU folks. We're over here talking about um, how to do some trainings uh, here, um, especially around community organizing and advocacy. But does ACLU in all areas offer trainings on how to articulate the issue in a better way? Because I think that's something that we could really benefit from here. Yeah, def definitely not. Um, we are different NGOs in every part of the country. And while we all have something really great about us, we're all very, very different. We are an organization, we are an affiliate that's really embraced um, the organizing aspect of our integrated advocacy model, probably because I, I am an organizer before I became a lawyer, et cetera. That being said, you know, I take a, I've known Brianne for a long time. So one of the things we did, for example, when we looked at um, Know Your Rights, we did it through the second verse of Jay-Z's 99 Problems, and we taught everything you need to know about the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment. And I know when I was with the People's Institute in New Orleans, we used to use um, Lil Wayne's mixtape at the time. That was a long time ago when he had a mixtape out there. And so we used to use the block is hot to talk about policing and the police, um, you know, the police state and the community, its impact. So we use a lot of, like, sort of popular um, culture I'm actually giving a training, and we'll talk about that, I guess, when we talk about our next tomorrow activities. I don't want to jump the gun. But um, I, you know, I'm happy to share videos of some of the trainings that we've given. And then, um, yeah, maybe we can work together to figure out what kind of trainings you're trying to do and how I can be helpful. Yeah, just so that you know. Uh, yeah, LA, absolutely. Thank uh, you. The, the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solution uh, would take pride in helping you design and develop a specific training that address the exact issues that um, you would like to encounter. Uh, certainly, we, are, we already have a relationship. Uh, in fact, tell James and Scott that Dr. Pryor said what's up. And certainly, we would be more than happy to also join in to help you design something that's tailor-made to your specific needs because, as it turns out, we're providing training for both on the ground as well as institutional stakeholders, community stakeholders, we're working in New York with the New York City Department of Probation. We're about to go directly into the belly of the beast, working with the NYPD. That's going to be interesting. But yes, uh, we have the capacity to help you design something specific to uh, whatever needs you might have. So actually, on that note, let's do a round of sharing. Thanks for queuing that, Seema. Um, if we can, oh, LA dropped off again. That'll be bad. <laughs> um, let's do a round of, I, I know not everyone has a day of action thing planned. But um, let's do a round of sharing in terms of that so we kind of get a sense. So, DC, you want to share your day of action? Yes. So, um, what we're now moving, you know, as after having done, so this is sort of really fits in very well with what's happening here in DC. After having done all this conversation about um, disparate policing practices, having identified the over policing of black communities, disparate impact, et cetera, et cetera. We're now moving into, a, and, and sort of the public response to that has been that it's not true, it's not happening. So the sort of typical, same sort of NYPD, typical standard response. So we're moving into how do we build a culture of observation in communities across the city? And how do we start training people not just to document police encounters, but what sort of information do they need to collect and upload? And how do we sort of democratize the process so that they're not reliant on any sophisticated technology? So tomorrow I'm actually giving a training to all of the protesters who are coming out to protest for DC Ferguson. And I'm going to be talking about um, what their rights are in the protest context. So if people decide to break the law, that's on them. 
but at least let it be civil disobedience and not simply ignorance. Um, so we're talking about First Amendment rights in the context of a First Amendment protest. We're talking about um, um, how to record the police and how to be a legal observer. And I'm happy to have that training recorded and upload it if that's helpful to that folks. Great. 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 I, I would also be interested in, um, in participating or helping to set up some kind of information sessions for parents because, yes, in the larger society, people of color are hyper-policed, but in educational institutions, I mean, as a former middle school principal and now, you know, I'm, I'm working in the community, how do I communicate to parents about their children's being hyper-policed in their middle schools um, and this psychological uh, kind of these scars being built up and the hardening of students at a very young age to be desensitive to some of the things that are going on in larger society so that when they get to be 15, 16, 17, they've become more susceptible to becoming incarcerated because they're, they're, they're just done. They're, they have so much scar tissue that they're not able to, to um, rationally contend with this, the, the demonizing, the larger demonizing culture. So how, I, I would really be interested to know how to, how to do that. I'm new to this. I'm a literature professor. I have no idea what I'm doing. And, and, and tandem with that, um, <laughs> in tandem with that, we were discussing offline how, um, you know, as, as Brother Bonaire Agard was, was mentioning, the, um, the youth and how their, their self-propelled way of looking at the movement, that it is, you know, all right, the, the older generation, you gray hair people, you did what you did and it didn't work, so we're gonna go ahead and do it with our sagging pants and with our facial tattoos and with everything else that we've got going on, we're going to take the reins on this. Um, I think that, you know, along with, along with what Michan was saying, we definitely have to have that dual approach. A parents, parents have to understand how their children are being targeted, and the children have to understand exactly how they're being targeted and, what's, and what traps there are out there for them. So here we are at an HBCU here in Texas, Texas Southern University, Texas Southern University right here in Houston. Um, one, of our, one of our main things is to make sure that we're going to put out this message um, to, to the student body here and to, to area schools just so they understand exactly what is being done to them. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, um, doctor, and I, 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 I'm sorry, I heard your name the first time in New York. Yes, Devon uh, Pryor, Dr. Devon Pryor. Doc, Dr. Pryor. Um, what you were mentioning, I think, is so integral to the conversation. Often, when we're talking about um, the prison industrial complex, I think we fail to uh, we fail to actually deal with the brass tacks of what the end result is 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 likely um, to be, which I, I think is a permanent underclass that they're trying to to, to maintain. Um, the way in which this country was created is on the backs of people who were who were building it for free. Um, that's why you have a, a profit motive associated with keeping the prisons full. Here in Texas, many of these small towns in the, in the far-flung areas um, deal directly with the prison industry as their main source of income. So if people are no longer criminalized, then they no longer have jobs. So, it, so it's incumbent upon them to make sure that they keep us in jail so that they can keep on making their money. Like I said in, like I said in my presentation, CCA in 2013 made $1.7 billion profit. There's something to be said for that. And I think that it's, it's, it's morally reprehensible for there to be a profit margin associated with something that is supposed to be um, kind of a social type of uh, policing mechanism, which is the so-called criminal justice system. So that's something we definitely need to deal with at its root. Um, I'm going to, so in terms of what you brought up, um, right now the, the best answer I have is uploading. I think, up, I think we have it set up as well. Uploading questions and the, the suggestions that you have as well, I think would, um, I think between all of us there's definitely resources. Um, yeah. So let's do that for now. And then um, we heard from DC in terms of day of action. Um, Chicago? Day of action? Uh, we're not doing a day of action tomorrow because, of course, uh, of course, I'm here in Alexandria. Um, <laughs> That's uh, but we do plan. We do plan on doing something uh, soon that show, that will correspond. Um, what we plan we're planning to have happen is uh, have some of the uh, students' work be read by outside people in front of an audience, actors, etc., and have a discussion around what that work is and what that work represents, et cetera. Right, and if you get to record it, um, if you could also yes. that would be great as well. Yes, absolutely, um, absolutely. 
And anyone else have any days of action planned? Yes. We have a day of action in uh, Amsterdam. Okay. Um, we have a, a very special uh, unit, experimental unit, in uh, one of our prisons. Uh, it's a place where uh, very long-term sentenced prisoners, and amongst them real-life prisoners, uh, have their department without any staff. They have their own keys of the doors, and they are uh, self-supporting uh, on that department. And what we do uh, on Prison Action Day is that uh, our foundation uh, financed uh, groceries for a big meal over there, and the inmates, they are going to uh, cook uh, a, a very hot, a very nice meal. And uh, Hester and me, and a few other people who are uh, present over here, they will go there, and we will have a nice meal from one to three tomorrow, and uh, discuss the outcomes of today with, uh, with the guys. And um, we're really looking forward to, to that. And, um, we are going to make a report on it, and it will be part of our contribution to your website as well. That would be wonderful. So, that would be wonderful. Okay, that's what we're going to do. And I suggest for next year, if I may yes. uh, continue that, uh, to, to um, collect all kinds of uh, uh, examples and um, uh, experiences uh, with empowering the people and giving people a voice who suffer the most of the negative consequences of our system. Um, like what Nenen did, uh, that example has to be followed, I think. And I think that we need examples of people in this uh, very uh, despair situation who are empowered to speak out and make a difference. I think that's very important to collect that. And the second one is a more technical one, because I think next year a lot of uh, European countries will, uh, who wanted to be involved but who couldn't get it organized on such a short notice will join the conference. And then there are a lot of suggestions over here uh, how to uh, arrange it technically because uh, there are very nice way, ways to have a very big conference uh, uh, without having problems of a technical, uh, you know, like uh, what we know is that when uh, the, the board of uh, Shell has its uh, international meeting, they don't meet any problems. So let's uh, follow their example as well. So great. It's music to my ears. And um, at the conclusion, we're going to ask for volunteers to be on the steering committee for the next year's, um, at, uh, next year's uh, event. Um, of course. And I, we will. I, I, I knew you would be one of them. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So um, this is great. Um, Hester too, eh? And then I think we have, do we have Dave Action in LA? Yeah, we're not, we're not doing, we're not going to be able to do something tomorrow, but we have a couple of things going on. One is that we are starting this discussion of, of for next year and that we really want to focus on what does a cross-departmental collaboration look like across departments in, in universities. So UCLA is doing a really good job of that. So by next year, we will have something to challenge all the other universities to do. A second piece of what we want to do is um, a day of dialogue where we will be teaching one curriculum in our Inside Out Writers program inside the Juvenile Hall and then do a similar curriculum um, in the community. So again, kind of just ensuring that the dialogue is going both inside and out. And then the third piece of action is that we are um, organizing a day of service for MLK. Okay. Next time. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to bring us, unless there's any other days of action, I'm going to bring us to New York. Um, I'm going to have Shani um, come and talk about human rights project stuff, and then um, Dr. Pryor will tell us about on the count shows over there. Hey, everybody. How are you? All right. <laughs> like a mic. Um, my name is Shawnee Jamila, and I'm an artist and the director of the Human Rights Project at the Urban Justice Center. It's been a real pleasure to hear about all of the work that you all are doing, so thank you for taking the time to share. Um, there's an event that we're planning that's coming up on Human Rights Day, which is December 10th. Uh, it'll be happening at the UJC's offices, and it's called Open Season. So the vision is that we are going to be looking not just as what all the statistics that were mentioned over the course of this conversation, but what is the culture that has created it? And how is it that we've been able 
to uh, construct the biggest prison industrial complex in the history of humankind in this country uh, and have the kind of racial disparities that we do that are pervasive throughout it. We want the artists to begin to look at this. So it'll be a layering of visual and performance art uh, and that's going to be interspersed with moderated conversations with some of uh, our best thought leaders and artists. So if any of you may be in New York on December 10th, I encourage you to come and if not, please spread the word to your communities here. Thanks. Uh, yes, and I wanted to uh, just inform you that uh, tomorrow um, at 11 o'clock, uh, both myself and Breon Bain will be on uh, WBAI, which is 99.5 on the FM dial. And you could also live stream. We also live stream it. So no matter where you are in the world, you could also participate. It's WBAI.org. And we will be talking about uh, some of the work that we're doing here in New York, but we want to really hone in on the whole issue of arrest diversion. Uh, the, the fact that young people or anyone gets caught up in the system, even if you're only in the system for a few hours, has a lifetime impact on terms of your restrictions and limitations in your movement. A lot of times we look at mass incarceration, but I want you to know we live in an age of technology now. And once you are arrested and fingerprinted and your mugshot is taken, you go out into cyberspace. That information can end up anywhere. So you're attempting to get into college or into housing or anything that you attempt to do that involves someone doing a background check, it has an impact on you. So we want to start cutting it off right at the root. We also want to talk about uh, our human justice campaign and what that really means and how we can use uh, international human rights principles and concepts to integrate into all of the work that we're doing globally so that we can begin to synchronize our work and construct a set of language that uh, puts us all on the same page. And then, of course, we want to talk about some of the remedies that are available for people who do get caught up in the system. And in each state is different. And I would like to know what you're doing globally. What happens after an individual is convicted? What happens after they've done time in prison? What do you do to help them restore their rights of citizenship? How do you help them integrate back into society? What barriers do they confront? What are the legal and regulatory mechanisms that you have in place that help individuals be restored black to their humanity? How do they become citizens again? How are they able to fully operate in society? So we're going to talk about these things and much more in the one hour that we'll have. So we're, we're inviting you to tune in 99.5 on the FM dial, but you can also live stream it, and it's WBAI.org. But thank you once again. This has been extraordinary, and I'm already excited about what the possibilities are for next year. Yes. Um, oh, okay. So I didn't realize I was going to be on camera, so I didn't get to prepare myself. But um, it's good to see everyone. I just wanted to uh, just quickly share um, a project uh, that's, that's starting here in New York City that I want to invite everyone around the world to, to be a part of. Um, and it's called the Youth Justice um, Visioning Pro Project. And, um, and it's really about one question, which is um, what will it take... What will it take? What will it take for us to eliminate um, detained, d you know, secured facilities for young people in the next decade? I have a three-year-old nephew. Um, Ten years from now, he'll be 13. I want to make it absolutely inconceivable that uh, he would have to face um, doing time in a prison. Um, and I think it's possible. I think in other parts of the world, uh, we've been able to do that. Um, we need to eliminate it from our culture, even our, even our, you know, our imagination that, that that's the way that we treat our youth. Um, and so we're having uh, these small gatherings in New York City uh, with folks who work in education, the arts, um, juvenile justice, um, and and business, and all all different fields to talk across their sectors about um, their best ideas about how we can engage young people, how we can transform um, the cultures of the, the way in which we engage um, a community um, in, in conversations about, about justice. Um, and we'll be bringing these conversations to other parts of, of the country and possibly even the world if, if you're interested. But it's a really, it's an opportunity to vision together um, because if we're going to create human justice, right, we need to have a really clear vision for what we want to be the alternative. Um, so I invite you to all participate in that. I'll upload some things to the website as well um, for you to learn about and pass this off to Brian. Thank you, Piper. So uh, I have the honor of introducing the closing video. And um, as an artist, 
Um, always trying to figure out how to use my art in, in an activist way to uh, abolish the prison industrial complex in uh, every way imaginable. Um, I want to share this with you. And this is not a shameless plug because I'm actually, this is a gift I'm going to give you. Um, if you send me your mailing address, I'm going to send you, can you see this? Is this showing up? This is Brian's favorite. Can y'all see this? This is not what I want. My favorite thing, just put it in the camera. Can, can y'all see this? Because we can't see what you can see. This is a digital mixtape. It has 15 tracks of music, 15 videos, and 50 hyperlinks to organizations that do work for returning citizens. 25 of those came highly recommended from the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in California. 25 of them came from the Center for New Leadership in New York City. And um, if you send us your address, I will send this to you so that you can utilize it come up with better ways to do it. And this is how it works. I got to show this to you because it might not make sense if you don't. This flips out, and it's actually a flash drive. So you, it plugs into your computer. If you have a Mac, it's the metal side up. We're going to show a video. The video is the first release from it. And it l focuses on Brooklyn, where I'm from, where I live. But it also speaks about the links between gentrification and incarceration across the country. And uh, I hope you will enjoy it, share it, check it out, and send your address so I can send you your own version of the mixtape, executive produced by DJ Cool Herc, I gotta say. Thank you all so much for joining us. This video is gonna be our close. I'm gonna see if we can get the transcript from this uh, uh, for, for, to circulate to everybody. And uh, if anybody has transcription abilities in their city, please give me a shout so we can work together on that. Thank you so much. And uh, please just give everybody a big round of applause for joining us. We're gonna cut to the video. Whenever we're ready. Big shout out to the Gallatin Theater staff for pulling this together. Give them a big round of applause. Amazing tech team. Conrad, Stephanie, everybody involved. Thank you. Can everyone see it? We walk the line, walk. Can everyone see it on the floor? Will he see your flesh upon? If there's fear in your heart. So scared of the dark. Wanna outline us in chalk. Evil eye of the eagle in the sky. Keep hawking you, stalking you like the clan used to. Tell me what the hell on earth a nigga supposed to do Caged in like we living in the Brooklyn Zoo Wanna bucket every motherfucker close to you So who, who, you gonna run to where you gonna hide When the sun of the morning is on your hide Say who, you gonna run to where you gonna hide Better holler at your fam if you wanna survive tonight Concentration camps in full effect More police on the street, what you expect White folks in brownstones collect bigger checks So boys in blue break next for corporate execs Yes, the condos is coming like the colonies And if you monkeys don't like it, you can swing from trees Shot down to Oaktown, Philly to Fort Greene East to West, it's the next manifest destiny East to West, it's the next manifest destiny East to West, it's the next manifest destiny This is how they do, this is how it's done This is how it's been since day one Just to have fun, this is what it is, uh -huh. what it be like yep. One false move, that's your ass tonight It ain't no good, and it ain't alright You in the wrong hood, you could lose your life You could lose your life, in the day and night Whether wrong or right, with or without a fight You could lose your life, in the day and night Whether wrong or right, with or without a fight Know how the natives 
this film. And TP's getting whipped with a Bible belt. We still the ice melt, now we can't come back. Them treaties were received, didn't mention that. Now my home is stolen and your boat is swollen. Me and my village never volunteered to do no wrong. And where on earth we going? Who the hell is Romans? Why you watching my sister like her ass is glowing? Hell no, officer, you can't expect my calling. We was just chilling here doing our own thing. Y'all came along claiming land for your king. Put a copyright on the song in every sing. Started cutting off bones in the name of bling. Like ancestors from Texas to the West Indies. Shot town to Oak Town, Philly to Fort Greene. East to West is the next manifest destiny. East to West is the next manifest destiny. You know. East to West is the next. East to West is the next. You know. East to West is the next manifest destiny. Bring it back one time. This is how I do. This is how it's done. This is how it's been. This is this day one. But still gonna be on the run. This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. This is out in Prospect. This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. This is out in Brown Heights. This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. This is out in Red Hook. This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. This is out in East New York. This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. This is out in Brownsville. This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. This is how them sunset niggas do. This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. This is how them Williams burn it This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. This is how them four green niggas do. This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. This is how them Clinton Hill niggas do. This is the sound of the Brooklyn Zoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. BK. Self-determination. Godverdomme. That means goddamn it in Dutch. Look at the lights on. <laughs> man, Cliff, I really appreciate you, man. Mm-hmm. Thank y'all. You got a mic? Yeah. Thank y'all so much. Thank y'all. I have a mic here. Thank you, everybody. We look forward to everybody's updates. All right. Thank Be you. well. Peace. Bye. There was a cameo at the end by Franz, uh, all the way from Amsterdam. So hopefully this will lay the groundwork for many more collaborations to come. Take care, y'all. Peace. 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 All right. Wow, we just did that. <laughs> Thank y'all for coming. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. <laughs> okay. Oh, well.